very helpful understanding the changes that have occurred. For the last 10 years, Carol herself has served as the Keeper of the National Register of Historic Places, which is the nation's listing of what is worthy of preservation. She has sought to make the register more accessible to the public through the Internet, National Register Bulletin Series, the discovery of our shared heritage travel itinerary series, and the innovative Keeping Historic Places program. She also serves as Chief of the National Historic Landmark Survey, which recommends places of national importance to be given national landmark status. Carol has written and lectured extensively on historic preservation and is the recipient of the Meritorious Service Award from the U.S. Department of Interior. Carol, we are honored to have you with us tonight as you give us your perspective on the National Register, a future for the past. Will you join me in welcoming Carol Thank Schultz? You. Thank you so much. First, I have to say I'm so relieved. I was looking at my watch, and by Washington time, it's 9.35. I thought, if these people have enough metal to listen to this lecture now, there are true historic preservationists in Indiana. <laughs> but I'm happy to say it's only 8.35. Um, anyway, it's, it's a real honor for me to be asked to give this keynote address at the 25th anniversary celebration of the Ball State Masters Program because I know the, I guess, some 150 preservation professionals who have received degrees from this distinguished program since 1979 are assuring that there is a future for our past as Ball State graduates work to preserve the historic places Americans value. I salute Professor Jim Glass and the other members of the faculty who give this program its strengths and especially commend you for the interdisciplinary curriculum you've designed. It recognizes that historic preservation truly is a blend of history, architectural history, architecture, law, economics, landscape architecture, and planning. I'm impressed by the hands-on uh, historic preservation projects and graduate assistantships with faculty members and preservation organizations that prepare Ball State students so well to work professionally in historic preservation. I have interviewed and hired many preservation professionals and student interns over the years, and I'm convinced that the Ball State program is giving its graduates the kind of credentials and real life experience that are sought after in candidates for preservation positions. The new Center for Historic Preservation will provide even more opportunities for Ball State and its faculty and students to perform important preservation work, providing services to the entire state. I know that Ball State graduates and, and students have done surveys and prepared National Register nominations as part of your degree program and part of your jobs. I'm glad that the Indiana Division of Historic Preservation and Archaeology with Ball State graduates like John Smith and Paul Debo, with whom I am privileged to work, and the Historic Landmarks Foundation of Indiana are partners and participants in the Ball State program because the students can draw on the incredible experience and knowledge of these very strong organizations. Now, I have to kind of hold up my hand to get the page turned here, so. One tribute, um, to the Indiana State Preservation Office and the Landmarks Foundation, and I think to the Ball State students and graduates, is how well represented Indiana is by listings in the National Register of Historic Places. Our National Register now has more than 78,000 listings encompassing some 1.3 million historic properties within their boundaries. Indiana has nearly 1,500 listings, including more than 37,000 historic properties, while Muncie alone has 36 listings with more than 1,000 contributing resources. And I know that the Ball State students and graduates can take credit for some of these listings. Uh, it's, it's particularly exciting to be here in the Civic uh, Center and, and see what a wonderful adaptive reuse this is. I'm also excited to see so many historic districts, and I especially like the one named after Emily Kimbrough, whose book, Our Hearts Were Young and Gay, was one of my favorites when I was a young person. 
You all know that widespread concern about the loss of our heritage led to the passage of the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966. Our Preservation Act is unique in the world because it sets up a framework for identifying, recognizing, and encouraging the protection of historic places that reflect the history of every community and the significant contributions of all of our citizens. This law gave the Secretary of the Interior the authority to expand and maintain a National Register of Historic Places, created an Advisory Council on Historic Preservation to review the impact of proposed federally assisted projects on places eligible for or listed in the register, and authorized federal matching grants to assist in inventorying and preserving historic places. The Act sets up a remarkable partnership of federal, state, local, and tribal governments and private citizens and organizations to achieve the goal of preserving the historic and cultural foundations of the nation as living parts of our community life and development. The National Register is designed to identify those places that should be considered in planning new construction and land use projects and whose preservation should be encouraged through economic incentives and technical assistance. America's historic places embody our unique spirit, character, and identity. After nearly 40 years, the National Register has a wide variety of building sites, district structures, and objects. Battlefields and archaeological remains are some of the sites. And we have more than 12,500 historic districts. All of Ole Township in Pennsylvania, more than 15,000 acres, is a rural historic district, one of an increasing number of rural historic districts reflecting the concern of Americans about the loss of significant historic landscapes. Structures, we even list airplanes as well as ships. And objects, not museum objects, but those tied to places such as statues, monuments, and even signs and street lights. The National Register embraces all levels of significance, national, state, and local. 60% of the 387 units of the National Park System are historic units rather than natural sites. They are listed at the national level of significance when they're added to the national park system. The National Park Service's National Historic Landmark Survey, which I administer with the National Register, studies themes at the national level and nominates properties that are designated by the Secretary of the Interior for their national significance. The Landmark Survey conducts theme studies to identify these landmarks sometimes at the behest of Congress, which in recent years has directed us to study the Underground Railroad, labor history, the desegregation of public education in the United States and other civil rights topics, and most recently, World War II on the home front. This is um, the Eleutherian College building, which is part of the Underground Railroad theme study here in Indiana, designated a National Historic Landmark. Uh, we now are, are working in partnership with the United States Air Force to study the history of aviation to identify sites in, in that theme in American history. These theme studies develop historic context statements and identify property types and registration requirements for landmark designation, but also for national register listing. They can help all of you in your work to find and evaluate historic properties throughout the states. Almost 2,400 National Historic Landmarks have been designated by the Secretary of the Interior for their exceptional value in illustrating our history. But most places are nominated by states, federal agencies, and Indian tribes. Well over 90% of the listings are of state and local significance, and nearly 80% are privately owned. Many nominations start with citizens and what they believe is important. And I guess I think most nominations start with citizens and what they believe are, is important. Everyone can participate in identifying places that should be recognized and proposing them to be nominated through the State Historic Preservation Officer 
uh, through a federal preservation officer or through a tribal preservation officer if they're on tribal lands. And the responsibilities of all these authorities are laid out in our remarkable National Historic Preservation Act, which has helped institutionalize and justify the creation of historic preservation programs at every level of government. And I might add, uh, this act has been the framework that has provided opportunities for professionals in historic preservation to find a place to help our citizens preserve what they value. More than 1,400 local governments which identify and provide means of protecting historic places in their communities have been certified to date to participate directly in the program and they receive 10% of the state's matching grants. Under the law, federal agencies, another place to employ Ball State graduates, inventory and nominate properties under federal ownership and control and more than 40 American Indian tribes have established tribal preservation programs that are authorized to receive grants and to nominate properties on their own reservations. Anyone can prepare a National Register nomination and anyone can appeal to the National Park Service the refusal of a nominating authority to nominate a property to the National Register. Local elected officials and property owners are notified and given an opportunity to comment and if private owners object, a property cannot be listed in the National Register. Because so much is done by our partners, the Department of the Interior's National Park Service has only a modest budget and staff to expand and maintain the National Register and make it accessible to the public. The National Park Service establishes criteria, procedures, and guidelines published in our National Register Bulletin Series to assist the public in identifying, documenting, and nominating historic places. We try to develop new bulletins with experts in the preservation field as we start to see an interest in recognizing new resource types as part of our heritage. Bulletins on some cutting edge property types include those on nominating properties from the recent past, on nominating rural historic districts and design landscapes, traditional cultural properties, and suburbs. And we also publish bulletins on other topics such as interpreting historic places. We have videos on the National Register and traditional cultural places and teaching with historic places that you can use in your own work. And we add new properties to the list. We also maintain what we call the National Register Information System, a computerized index to listings, and an archive of information on listed properties throughout the nation. The National Register has welcomed what we call multiple property submissions based on historic contexts and themes developed by nominating authorities. We have digitized and made available over the, the web some 1,800 of these historic context documents that help others evaluate many themes in American history. With funds donated by some of our partners, we are beginning to digitize all the documentation on each listing in the National Register and to make it available over the internet. We have found that the internet is by far the best means of making the National Register available to the people. Last year, the overall National Register website received approximately 164 million hits. It includes special features, such as general information on the National Register, downloadable versions of our National Register bulletins and nomination forms, and the computerized index to the National Register and these very valuable historic context documents that explain and document many themes in American history. Full documentation is available on some listings, including the whole registration form with its description, statement of significance, bibliography, maps, and photographs. In addition, we have two major public education programs using our website to assist adults and young people in understanding and experiencing the power of historic places. Heritage tourism protects historic, cultural, and natural resources. 
It promotes economic and civic vitality, creates jobs, increases property values and retail sales, and generates tax revenues, while educating people about history and building stronger communities. The National Register promotes the, excuse me, promotes the fast growing heritage tourism industry nationwide through our ongoing Discover Our Shared Heritage travel itinerary series. The program began in 1995 with five printed itineraries highlighting historic places associated with early settlement and development in five regions of the New World. These were prepared in partnership with the National Conference of State Preservation Officers and funded by the American <coughs> Express Company. The program has expanded to 36 online travel itineraries featured on our website with more in the works, all developed with partner organizations throughout the nation. These itineraries explore historic cities, towns, regions, and themes by highlighting, describing, and linking places listed in the National Register. Each itinerary is a self-guided tour that provides descriptions of places to visit, maps, and links to other pertinent websites. Our goal is to bring historic places to the attention of the traveling public and support sites and communities seeking to use heritage tourism for economic development. Indiana is represented with listings in the Aviation and Underground Railroad thematic travel itineraries. On our website, we invite partners to propose to work with us to develop travel itineraries to add to the series. Two of our most recent itineraries, one for the Main Street communities in Virginia and another for Asheville, North Carolina, were developed with a variety of partners in those areas. We've been approached by the East Region Tourism Marketing Cooperative in Indiana with an idea to develop a travel itinerary on registered historic places in 24 counties in eastern Indiana and spoken with the Indiana State Historic Preservation Office staff to discuss developing an itinerary for Indianapolis. I hope that you will keep in mind the possibility to partner with us to develop travel itineraries that include the communities in which you work. And we can't fail to educate our young people about historic places. The National Register's Teaching with Historic Places is an educational program aimed at helping young people understand our nation's heritage so that they will be more informed citizens and better stewards of historic places. This award-winning program uses places listed in the National Register to enhance traditional classroom instruction of history, social studies, geography, and other subjects. And all of our lessons are keyed to the social studies and history standards to which teachers must, must teach. The cornerstone of Teaching with Historic Places is the series of classroom lesson plans written by historians and educators. We now have, I believe, 118 lesson plans available for downloading from our website, and educators are working with us to prepare more. Uh, this is the cover of the lesson plan entitled Two American Entrepreneurs, Madam C.J. Walker and J.C. Penney. And it's really a, one of my favorite lessons because it tells the story, two very American stories of two very different entrepreneurs. And one of the historic properties showcased is the Madden C.J. Walker Manufacturing Company building a uh, National Historic Landmark in Indianapolis. And of course, this uh, tells students the remarkable story about um, Madam Walker, the first African-American millionaires in America. Some more examples. Um, the lesson on the force of old San Juan, uh, which teaches students how the Spanish fortifications on the island of Puerto Rico helped protect Spain's expanding interest in the New World, has been translated into Spanish. The National Register criteria for evaluation have remained in place for nearly 40 years and are used throughout the United States to provide a consistent national system for evaluating and registering historic places. Despite its breadth, the National Register is rigorous in its judgments about properties to be listed. To be eligible, a property must have integrity of location, 
design, setting, materials, workmanship, feeling, and association, and meet at least one of the four criteria. A property that has achieved significance within the last 50 years may be eligible only if it is of exceptional significance, and about 3% of our listings have met that exceptional standard. Under the criteria, a property may be eligible for the register if it's associated with events that have contributed to the broad patterns <laughs> of our history. And we have quite a variety, including uh, much of Cape Canaveral in Florida, which is designated for its exceptional significance because of the central role in the history of space exploration. Properties might qualify if they illustrate the lives of significant persons, as do the homes of civil rights leader Martin Luther King in Atlanta, Mariano Vallejo in California. He was a pivotal figure in local history during the Mexican administration of the state. And yes, Elvis Presley's home, Graceland. We wouldn't want to forget the home of the king of rock and roll and uh, many, many other places associated with important citizens at the national, state, and local level. <coughs> a property may illustrate distinctive architectural engineering or artistic design achievement and embody the distinctive characteristics of a type, period, or method of construction. Um, this is the Flatiron Building in New York City and the Reliance Building, a prime example of the Chicago School of Architecture, and a simple eye house in North Carolina, an example of vernacular architecture, and preservationists have more and more turned their attention to recognizing the places associated with everyday citizens, not just the magnificent buildings associated with the rich or famous. And of course, we've got uh, Wigwam Village in Kentucky, which illustrates the impact of the automobile on American architecture. You can actually stay in those wigwams if you go to Kentucky. Listing roads, highways, and roadside architecture is another recent trend. And of engineering structure, I point to the Bronx River Parkway, the very first parkway in the United States. We have uh, also works of masters and properties of artistic importance. Up on the left is the masterwork of Charles Bullfinch, the Massachusetts State House, and then the Fox Theater. But then we have prehistoric rock art sites that also have artistic value. Historic districts may meet any of the register criteria, and listed commercial, industrial, and residential districts have become the centerpieces and focal points of community revitalization efforts. Um, on the bottom there, the residential and commercial buildings, mining structures, and even the tailing piles produced by the mines are all integral parts of the historic district uh, that tell the story of mining in the area and define the character of Cripple Creek, a mining town in Colorado. We also list places, generally archaeological sites, that have yielded or may be likely to yield information important in history or prehistory, uh, particularly like this is Chaco Canyon, one of our units of the park system, but also we list a number of underwater um, shipwrecks and archaeological sites, this one in the Great Lakes. National Register listing honors a historic place by recognizing its importance. Listing often changes the way property owners and communities view a property and strengthens the credibility of efforts to preserve historic places. Travel literature and tourism promotion, historical guides, real estate advertisements, and other publications frequently cite which places are registered. Listing is widely viewed as a decided advantage in the desirability of a place, and it can enhance property values. In the United States, respect for private property rights is very strong. Under federal law, National Register listing does not restrict property owners from doing whatever they choose with their properties, and this is often misunderstood. 
Owners are not obligated to restore, maintain, or open their properties to the public. In fact, they don't even have to preserve them for that matter. Federal agencies must, however, provide the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation an opportunity to comment before carrying out a project that will affect a listed or eligible property. But the agency can decide what is in the public interest once the historic values are considered. We call this good planning. State Historic Preservation Offices review well over 100,000 projects each year uh, to evaluate their potential impacts on historic places and they make a huge difference in the quality of those projects and much has been preserved as a result of that step in the planning process. Federal Historic Preservation Tax Incentives have spurred the revitalization of communities throughout the United States. The 20% federal tax credit available to owners or lessees who rehabilitate historic buildings by preserving their character using the Secretary of the Interior standards has made a remarkable contribution to preserving communities. Income producing commercial and rental residential buildings that are either individually listed in the National Register or contribute to the significance of a registered historic district may qualify. Every imaginable building type has been rehabilitated, including breweries like this one in Minneapolis, which is now the offices of, for the architect of the Target Corporation, which I think is kind of amusing. Uh, Since 1976, more than 31,000 rehabilitation projects have used the federal tax incentives, generating, coincidentally, more than $31 billion in private investment in historic buildings, much of it in urban neighborhoods and commercial districts. Um, this is the Hotel Monaco in Washington, D.C., which is located in the old post office, one of the nation's first federal buildings. It's now leased to a private corporation which rehabilitated it into a luxury hotel and took advantage of the tax credit. This is also an example of a project in which the federal agency that owns the building, the General Services Administration, sought the comments of the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation in planning the projects. Rehabilitation projects have created an estimated 49 jobs for each project more than 62,000 jobs last year alone in communities. The program stimulates community renewal, provides affordable housing, promotes sustainability, increases property values, enhances state and local tax revenues, and builds community pride. It fosters renewed interest in traditional building skills, promotes sound preservation practices, and fosters increased industry support in in providing products and services suitable for historic renovation. This library in uh, Sioux City, Iowa has been rehabilitated as low-income housing. The program has created nearly 71,000 units of low and moderate income housing. In addition, under federal law, certain contributions of charitable easements on historic properties for preservation purposes qualify for federal income estate and gift tax deductions. This is becoming a powerful and increasingly important tool in preserving historically important land areas and structures, particularly in the face of urban sprawl, one of the biggest issues in historic preservation in the United States today. National Register listing also qualifies historic places to be considered for Federal Historic Preservation Fund matching grants. In 2004, of $74 million that were made available, about $32 million were used for Save America's Treasures grants to help address pressing preservation needs of nationally significant historic resources, including stabilizing the ancient cliff dwellings of National Park and World Heritage Site Mesa Verde, and also helping to preserve Frank Lloyd Wright's Kaufman House, widely known as Falling Water. The rest of the funds were distributed to states, about not quite 35 million, and I was just really excited today to see how the Indiana State Preservation Program 
is partnering with the new Center for Historic Preservation and using some of their historic preservation fund matching monies to do some extremely worthwhile projects to get the new center off the ground. Indian tribes get about $3 million, and that's not very much to spread among 40 plus tribes. There are also small amounts going to the National Trust for Historic Preservation and to historically black colleges and universities. Many states and localities also have their own grant and tax incentive programs to help preserve registered historic places. The National Register is dynamic as it continues to recognize new types of properties with the passage of time and new scholarship and supports public and private efforts to identify and protect the historic places Americans have come to value as part of our heritage. And I have to say, one of the most gratifying things about working in this field for all of us who share an interest in preservation is that it's not static. Heritage doesn't stop. As people start to feel in their hearts that a new kind of property is important, then we embrace it and recognize it as part of our community's heritage. Trends include listing places from the more recent past, uh, such as exceptionally significant modern architecture. This is Dulles Airport, or Saarinen's great building, and, and Gropius's house, and two uh, locally significant uh, pieces of modern architecture, the Sims Building in New Mexico and the 1958 Citizens Bank Building in Oklahoma City, based on the designs of Buckminster Fuller which was, of course, a radical departure from the far more classically inspired bank designs. This is E. Faye Jones' remarkable Farn Crown Chapel. And that's uh, an oil well site in Alaska, and of course, we've registered many diners. And we have some very interesting um, pieces of modern art this is the Rothko Chapel in, in Houston, Texas, that was designed to um, house uh, some of Mark Rothko's most important uh, and late, his latest works uh, before his death. And that's very different from Grime Mall Prisby's Bottle Village site in California, which is an exceptionally significant uh, folk art site. The Indiana State Historic Preservation Office's submission of a multiple property nomination for the incredible architectural properties in Columbus, Indiana, resulted in their documentation and the listing of a, a number of the exceptional examples of modern architecture there and landscape architecture. And since then, as a result of their good work in documenting the incredible contributions of um, Mr. Miller and the Cummings Engine Company and the, the, the results of the architectural uh, masterworks there, uh, six of those buildings have since been designated by the Secretary of the Interior as National Historic Landmarks. Roads and roadside architecture, Route 66, the Lincoln Highway, and even uh, the interstate highway system are being studied and evaluated for the National Register, not to mention your own uh, national road. And we're listing many suburbs, uh, the subject of our most recent National Register Bulletin. Uh, the one at the top uh, is Arapahoe Acres, one of the few post-World War II suburbs we've re uh, registered for exceptional significance. But um, young people who come to work in our office see these uh, post-World War II suburbs as being very historic. Some of us who've been around a little longer <laughs> may find them a little younger. And we need to recognize the places associated with diverse uh, cultural groups. I like to point particularly to this slide on the left. This is the uh, Zuni Salt Lake and Sanctuary site in um, New Mexico. It's more than 182,000 acres uh, sacred historic district, sacred to five Indian tribes, and it's really quite a remarkable landscape. At the Salt Lake is where Salt Mother lives, and the tribes go there 
together salt, and they have a number of very sacred ceremonies associated with the landscape and the lake itself. And the picture of the building is at Fox Lake, an, an African-American resort here in Indiana. And then we have the Kowar. Here's a Kowar site uh, in Alaska. This is a Nike Hercules missile installation. And finally on the right, uh, the Green Springs Historic District, which is more, one of more than a dozen rural historic districts listed in the National Register in Virginia. One of the rural historic districts outside of Charlottesville is uh, more than 52 square miles. So we're getting some big ones. Kentucky, Kentucky has, I think, even more uh, large rural historic districts uh, registered. So there's a growing interest in preserving our rural landscape. I'll close and let us go on to the reception by congratulating Ball State University and everyone associated with this Master's in Preservation program for 25 years of service to the nation and turning out leaders who have the training and skills to help us preserve and educate others about the historic places Americans value. And I also want to thank every one of you here and particularly uh, the people who won awards um, from the preservation program because it, it all starts with the people who care and, and you do all the work. All we do at, with the National Register is recognize um, and help you preserve the things that we all treasure. I know all of you will do everything you can in your educational, professional, and advocational work to get the historic places that qualify, nominated, and listed in the National Register. And I hope you'll use the National Register's tools and benefits to help you not only evaluate, nominate, and protect these places, but to, to educate the public about why they are so important to all of us. And I hope uh, that many of the students here will consider doing some of these kinds of projects that I've suggested here, not only preparing National Register nominations, which look great on your resume, but are also an enormous public service, but also consider working with us on some of these lesson plans and travel itineraries, and also on other educational projects that uh, tell others about the values of these places, because quite often they can't speak for themselves. Historic preservation is about preserving our heritage, yours and mine. We are so fortunate to be preservationists and for those who work in, our, in it professionally to make it our lives work. The organizations, communities, and citizens um, that those of us who work in preservation every day serve um, are, we're lucky to be able to serve them, and I think that the kinds of graduates we're seeing coming from Ball State are just incredible assets um, to the communities that they serve. And I, and I know all of us working together can recognize and preserve this irreplaceable heritage we have so that as it says in our National Historic Preservation Act, it's vital legacy of cultural, educational, aesthetic, inspirational, economic, and energy benefits will be maintained and enriched for future generations. Thank you very much. Does anybody have a question? I hope I haven't worn you out. Yeah. 